Hello, Rebels, and welcome to episode two of the Rebel and Reawaken podcast, uh, where we are rebelling against just surviving and reawakening our minds, bodies, and souls to a life we love by reigniting our passion and zeal for life. So this week we talked about, or actually last week, we talked about um, infusing our lives with childlike wonder and joy by remembering what we used to love to do as children and finding ways to incorporate that back into our daily lives. So today I want to introduce my friend Claire to you. She has taken her passion for gardening and turned it into something that gives her genuine happiness. So welcome to the party, Claire. Teresa, thank you so much for having me. You created a wonderful platform here, and it's an honor to be invited to speak with you. And thank you for everyone that's tuned in today to listen. Yay! Okay, so we're going to start with some rapid fire questions so that we can get to know you. I always feel like these are um, so telling of a person. So let me grab those really quick. Of course, I forgot to have them queued up. No problem. <laughs> All right. Okay. So just off the top of your head, answer the questions. Um, work or play? Um, I'm going to say play. <laughs> Me too. Okay. Money or happiness? Happiness by far. Definitely happiness. That's an easy one. Yeah. Uh, cats or dogs? Ooh. Both. I just, I really enjoy animals in general. There's bring different things to the table. You sound like my daughter. My daughter is such an animal person. We got, she's getting her first car and we got leather seats was a mandatory requirement because I know that as soon as she's not in my house anymore, she's going to pick up every stray that she possibly can. <laughs> Leather just to keep everything safe. <laughs> yeah. She could wipe down leather a lot easier than cloth. cloth. Exactly. It's nearly impossible to get, to get out of the cloth. Oh, I know. Yeah. Okay. So let's see. Where we okay, summer or winter? Summer. Definitely summer. I do enjoy the snow and whatnot, but it's nice to be able to just go out and not have to put on a whole bunch of layers and plants in the garden and see the life. Definitely summer. Summer, yeah. Uh, morning or evening? I used to be an evening person, but I think that's changed. It's um, it's morning now. I'm a morning person. Cool. I love my mornings. Uh, salty or sweet? Salty. Definitely salty. I love savory treats. <laughs> Me too. Uh, beach or lake? Lake. Yeah, yeah, definitely the lake. I love the trees around and seeing wildlife and I can find shade, <laughs> which I really like about the lake. Yeah. Um, okay, mountains or plains? Ooh, plains, because plains can take me to mountains and other places. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, pool or lake slash ocean so basically like man-made water or natural water natural water every single time same here yeah, My, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay vegan slash vegetarian or meat eater meat eater although i don't eat a lot of meat there's um definitely meals that i i can't go without so i would I'm turning to eat to incorporate more vegetables and um, more whole foods into my diet, but I definitely am a meat eater. Cool. Okay. And last one, flying or driving? Oh, I would say driving because of the journey and everything that you get to see along the way. That's something you just, you can't get when you're just going from destination to destination, to point A to point. From point A to point B. Yeah, I'm the same way. And my husband loves to fly. So, like, I love to drive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Opposites attract. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> you can balance it out. Do a little bit of driving for one and then fly. Yeah. Okay. So, let's start with who you are, what your interests are, hobbies, like where you are in the world. Just tell me a little bit about yourself. 
I currently live in Toronto. I've lived um, all over the world in between. I've lived in Italy to us and Australia. And I've always loved the outdoors and nature and spending time outside. I recently started up gymnastics after a 20 year hiatus. So that's kind of a big deal. And um, I, I live in a downtown, um, pretty crowded area. So it's hard to find, um, it's, um, it's harder to find nature and the inner peace that it brings when living downtown in a big city. So it's forced me to get creative and really find ways to bring nature to me, if that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. Gymnastics. That's crazy. Like 20 year hiatus. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I broke my leg when on the bars when I was a kid. So it was something I thought about, but it um, took a lot of work to get there. <laughs> so yeah. It's been, um, it's been quite rewarding now that I'm actually doing it. <laughs> yeah, gymnastics is, I think people underestimate how physically strenuous it is. Like it takes a lot. A lot on your body. And as, as much as it is um, a physical thing, it's also a mental thing. Because you have to get over that your fear and that you're not going to hurt yourself and so I think that's what I like most about it is it's the combination of a physical and mental challenge. So it's, it's been amazing. Yeah, for sure. Well, congrats on that. Thank you. All right. Oh, go ahead. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. So tell us a little bit about your sober journey. Like how long alcohol was a problem for you? When did you stop? Why did you stop? That sort of thing. Absolutely. Oh, thank you so much for asking. It's, it's really freeing to be able to talk about this. I was always a social drinker, um, drinking with friends occasionally, but it was never really an issue for me. And things kind of changed during COVID. Um, I was stuck at the house all, all the time and we were in a lockdown in Toronto here. We had the longest lockdowns in the world. So it was a lot. And I ended up in a dark place and I found I was drinking more and more and suppressing heart, my hard feelings and past traumas and emotions. So I found I was drinking too much and I just wasn't in the place that I wanted to be. Um, and I was using alcohol as a coping mechanism, but it was very unhealthy. So I decided that I needed to change things in order to build a better life for myself and I had to put in the work in order to be able to do that. So I started to focus on my mental and physical health and um, for going alcohol was really the only way I could see that I would um, be able to focus on those things. Mm -hmm. So I um, slowly started to try and replace drinking with more, um, with healthier habits and that I, that I want to have. And... So what has been the hardest part um, staying sober the first few weeks or days or months and how did you get through it? Well, the hardest part was definitely when I had a bad day and my typical coping mechanism was having a glass of wine. Um, so it was finding alternatives to that and um, finding things to fill the time when I would drink. And I also found it really hard when friends would ask me to go out and do the same things that I used to do. And I had to put myself first and say no, which is something I'm getting better at, but it's still hard. It's still hard to say no and to feel like I was going to miss out on something and the fear of missing out. Um, so that was big for me. And then I, um, I learned to sit with the discomfort. So I would feel like I, oh, geez, I don't know what to do. I'm, I really need to have a glass of wine. But I would sit with it and understand that I'm feeling uncomfortable and let that feeling pass. And it did. It did. And it became, becomes easier the more and more that you, you do that and you practice that. So I have a... 
I have a friend that's that I actually talked to about this last night. So I have a follow up question that's not in the not in the plan. But so while you so while you were letting the the feeling pass, did you do anything in particular? Like, did you do any breathing exercises or did you like journal or did you just literally sit? Because I was trying to explain to her how to sit with like sit through the discomfort and trying to give her tools and like real life examples of what that looks like. So I'd like to hear from you what you what that actually meant practically sitting through the moment. Absolutely. So sitting through the, the moment sometimes looks like literally sitting and listening to yourself and going inwards and not ignoring how you're feeling and addressing it. And sometimes um, working through those feelings was overwhelming. So I would find myself stopping and taking three really deep breaths. Um, sometimes I would even give myself a hug and talk to myself the way I would want to be spoken to in the way that I wanted to be spoken to when I was a child. So talking myself down and saying it's okay to feel this way and you're going to get through it and you're strong and it's going to be worth it and look at you go. <laughs> so I would tell myself those things and that really helped. And some days it would be finding peace and distraction, if that makes sense. So I would go for a nature walk or go by the water and having the natural environment around me would help me process in a healthy way and seeing birds and seeing wildlife and whatnot would help um, calm me and put me in a space where I really was able to work through in a nice way. So that's yeah. been a big part of my journey for sure. Well, thank you for sharing that. Hopefully she'll hear it and it'll help her too. Cause yeah, it's hard. Like, it's hard to, I think for, especially for me coaching people, like whenever I try to tell them, like, you've just got to sit through it. Well, what does that actually like look like, you know? And so it's, it's good to have different perspectives from different people of what sitting with those emotions actually looks like. So thank you for that. Exactly. And it's different for everybody. And I'm always interested to learn and um, what that means for other people as well. So I can learn from them. Yeah. Okay, so let's see. What has been the highest mountaintop experience for you so far? Ooh, so my highest mountaintop experience by far is this exact healing journey that I'm on right now. I am so incredibly proud of myself, and sometimes I, I can't believe that I've come this far from where I've been. Um, I'm putting in the work and I'm breaking the generational cycles and breaking trauma patterns and learning how to love myself again and how to love myself at all, I guess, <laughs> and how to regulate my emotions and deal with hard things and crisis effectively and in a positive way that makes, um, makes a positive change instead of making the situation worse. Um, <laughs> And it's, it's really funny because these things are hard to quantify tan tangibly, but I sure feel the changes um, every day and how I'm managing things and how I'm um, able to step back from situations instead of instantly reacting to them. So that's been a, a huge change for me because I was very reactionary and I had many toxic patterns and habits that I brought to relationships and friendships. So I think um, that's definitely been my mountaintop experience is, is doing this for me and deciding that I'm going to change my life and I'm going to build a life that's worth living for me. Yeah, I love that. Like I, one of the things that I like to do with people is have them look at their family history, because I think a lot of times we don't even realize the general generational cycles that exist in our families. And like, we do things because that's just the way it's always been. But we don't actually ever like think about the fact that like, wait, just because it's always been that way does not mean it has to stay that way. And like, we can be the first generation to not live that way and to show the next generation that it can be different. And so, yeah. And I, I want to heal my trauma so that 
I have the tools to pass on to my children and my um, people in my life and I can um, change patterns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, so let's see what's next. I, I believe that the secret to cultivating a life that you truly love, whether you're in recovery or not, just, you know, normal everyday person or us peoples in, in the recovery world is to um, intentionally carve out time for yourself to do things that bring you true joy and happiness. And I know this is something that you've been able to, th to do through your garden and so um, my hope is that you will inspire others to find things that they truly enjoy and they will make these things a priority in their own lives so that they can replenish their emotional fuel tank by doing things that they enjoy and feel rewarding, feel like a reward to their soul. And so tell me all the things about your garden, because this is how we met. I was scrolling and I saw your post about your secret garden and I was like, wait, what? Yes. So I live downtown in a row house and I have a little laneway space in between the two houses. And I decided this year that I could really change it and make the most of it. So I um, brushed out all of the brush that was there and created a blank slate. Wow, that was a lot of work. <laughs> but it's um, something about the delayed gratification that really um, was meaningful to me. So once I um, got the brush out, I started planting plants and have some perennials and some annuals. And I tried to make it a, a peaceful space that kind of reflected the journey that I'm on. Um, and a space that I could go and sit and find peace. And it's funny, you don't realize it, but having um, greenery around you and flowers really does change the way you feel and it impacts um, your life. <laughs> so it was, it's a work in progress and it's um, very, very rewarding. And I sit there and I think of new things to add and new things to do. And it's a great way, um, a great positive hobby to have and a great way to use um, the new time that I have now that I'm not drinking. <laughs> so it's, um, it's definitely, it's ever changing and ever growing just like me, and it brings me so much pure joy. It's, um, it's a type of joy that it's, it's hard to describe. Um, and the wildlife and the impact that it has there. And I've been growing a lot of edible foods. And with this journey that I'm on, I've been changing my diet to try and include healthier foods and more greens and whole foods. So it's, it's, such a feeling to be able to go out in the morning and take a look and see the changes and grab something to bring in and put in my smoothie or add to my breakfast. So I encourage anyone, whether you live in a big space or a small space, even if you just have a tiny windowsill, you can plant something and I can ensure it'll bring you some joy. Yeah. And it's like, you created this thing, like you, you created life, you know, and, and now you're going to eat it and it's just like, yeah, it's, it's so rewarding. <laughs> and the flowers that I planted will help attract the bees, which will then pollinate my veggie and my fruit bushes. And it's, um, it's amazing to be able to slow down enough to witness and be part of something like that. Yeah. And I think that's, that's the thing. Like, I think when we're, I know when I was drinking, it was this never ending cycle of like, go to work, come home, drink a glass of wine to decompress, drink another glass of wine because the first one went down too fast <laughs> and then wake up with a head, a headache or like slightly hungover and then just, you know, repeat the cycle every single day. And then the weekend was this just like rush to, you know, go to events or go to this, go to that and probably hung over because there were probably cocktails and there, you know, it was just this constant cycle and with sobriety, I'm like, oh, I don't need two hours in bed to let the Tylenol and the Alka-Seltzer click kick in. So <laughs> exactly. And look how much joy and how many wonderful other ways there are to spend our time. Yeah, it's insane. I try to explain it to my husband and he's just like, 
okay. And I'm like, you don't understand how freeing it is. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. And to wake up on the weekend and feel like, okay, this is a nice Saturday morning and I'm, I'm going to seize the day and do the most with it instead of feeling like, oh my God, and end up wasting most of the, the day in bed and then repeating the cycle that night because I'm feeling guilty and anxious about being hungover. And then it repeats Sunday and yeah. now, now I'm definitely um, enjoying other things. Well, whatever. <laughs> other things other yeah it's just you find out all this cool new stuff about yourself and yeah it's so much fun um, okay so what are your short-term and long-term goals for yourself my short-term goals are to continue to heal and continue to learn how to be enough for myself and building a sober life and a life of stability and long term, um, I'd love to own my own home and build a peaceful and fulfilling life. I want to be able to share my life with a loving partner and be able to create an create environment that will cultivate healthy children and continue to find new passions and explore what makes me feel alive on the same. It's um, the most amazing things I'm finding are the things that push my comfort zone um, just enough in a healthy way. Yeah, for sure. I know like it's hard when you're in early recovery because for so long the drugs or the alcohol were your crutch to go do new things or to go do, you know, go to social situations. You know, you had to put on, you know, take a few drinks of wine to like loosen yourself up. And when you're sober, you have to just have courage to go do it. <laughs> exactly. And really be present in the moment. And it's, it's so nice to be able to remember and have these experiences. Yeah. And <laughs> Cause there's a lot that I don't remember when I was drinking. I'm sure I did fun things, but what does it really matter if you don't remember it and you don't have those memories? Exactly. Okay. If you could give um, people in early recovery, a piece of advice, what would it be? Be kind to yourself and take it one day at a time. And I'm going to emphasize, be kind to yourself. I found when I looked too far ahead, I would get overwhelmed and it would put me in kind of a paralyzing state. So take it slow and remind yourself that you're on a journey and it's not going to be overnight. And there's going to be ups and downs and that's okay. And it's okay to not be okay. It's important to slowly build a routine that doesn't involve using substances in an unhealthy way. Um, I'm not a very routine oriented person. So that was a very big challenge for me, but I'm loving my routine and, um, and it's, it's been a very positive change in my life. And usually when I get home from work, um, I would have a drink. This is before. <laughs> so for myself getting home now and going outside to move my body has been a big change. And in my lull and pleasure time, I go out now and work on the garden and work on things that bring me authentic happiness and spend time with friends, making meaningful connections with new people and connecting with friends that I didn't really have time for um, when I was drinking, which is really nice. <laughs> yeah. um, before sobriety, I didn't really eat, eat breakfast. Now I've formed a new routine where I make a smoothie every morning to nourish my body. So it's important to think about your reasons. What are the benefits of less drinking for you or not drinking at all? And I'll never get over how nice it feels to wake up hangover free on the weekend. The feeling when someone calls me and they need me and I can be there for them right away because I'm not drinking. That's happened a few times and that feeling is something I, <laughs> is irreplaceable <laughs> and the feeling I'm not questioning what I said the night before to somebody is something um, that means a lot to me so you have to kind of figure out for you what are your reasons because it's it's different for everybody so when I'm in going through something tough and I'm thinking oh it would be great to have a glass of wine that would help I remember well why am I really doing what what would the benefit be and why am I on this journey in the first place and that's always grounding and brings me back to 
brings me back. <laughs> right. And yeah, I think, yeah, I said everything. Okay. So last question. If you could speak directly to someone who is struggling to juggle life and thinks that they just don't have time to cut out the time to do something that brings them genuine joy, what would you tell them? Tell them that sometimes it seems impossible to find time for yourself, but it takes prioritizing yourself and that can be scary at first. It's consistency and small steps and realizing that you're worth taking the time for you and you're worth finding happiness again. You can't be your, uh, the partner, the mother, the friend, et cetera, to anyone if you're not there for yourself first. And it may seem selfish, but it's actually just the opposite of being selfish. It's vital. It may make you uncomfortable at first, but usually that's where the growth happens and the core memories are made. You may have no idea what brings you joy anymore like I did. I had no idea. I started by thinking back to what was fun for me when I was a kid and then branching out to trying new things entirely that I knew I would be bad at and I would probably make a fool of myself. <laughs> don't be afraid to try something new and don't be afraid to look like a fool. <laughs> it's only foolish when you don't try the new thing and you rob yourself the, of the potential experience. Yeah, I love it. You said all the things. Yes, that's like good. Okay. So that's it for today's episode. I hope this inspires you to prioritize your mental health by choosing to partake in something that brings you true joy. Um, you deserve to be happy and to have fun. And remember that if you're ready to start digging deep into this topic or any others, you can hop on over to our Patreon page or join the Rebel VIP uh, membership and get access to weekly trainings um, that expand on what we talk about in the podcast. Um, and then you can start to cultivate an abundantly fulfilling life in recovery by reigniting your passions and zeal for life. So be well, be kind, and may you find some joy this week.